Valley? You doing well? You look good? You look like you got a little sleep last night? Yeah? After all the partying from Christmas and all that and the late nights and the... You look great. I'm, gra I'm, I'm gl grateful that I can say Happy New Year uh, and, and, and we are not only in a new year but as Pastor Isaac mentioned, a new decade. Isn't that amazing? That Didn't 2020 seem like it was so far away? If you think back to Y2K, you thought, man, 2020, that's forever into the future, you know, and here we are. I mean, it's crazy how this life uh, flies by when you really think about it and, uh, uh, you know, when I used to hear people my age now or older say that as a kid I'd be like yeah whatever I you know and uh, but my, my 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 mom always said you know when you're raising kids and and uh, you're in that process of life and pretty soon grandkids she used to say the uh, what you say the days are long but the years are short right and isn't that so true you just get to a place where you look back and you go man where did that time go and um, you know I'm excited to kick off a brand new four-week series with you this weekend in fact I want to welcome uh, every Everybody joining us online at the podcast or at our YouTube live or Facebook live or however you're tuning in, we're glad to have you. In fact, you can share us on Facebook if you want and get this out to many, many more as we go dive into this today. But we are in a brand new series um, and the reason I'm excited about this series is because it's the first time I've ever devoted a multi-part series to the subject of how we handle our finances, how we handle our money. And so you're going to need a Bible as always and you can slip your hand up in the air if you need a Bible. If you didn't bring one or don't have one, we'd love to connect you with one or you can turn in your device if you'd rather use that. We're going to be in Luke, the Gospel of Luke chapter 12. The Gospel of Luke chapter 12. Luke is uh, the third book in the New Testament. So if you find the New Testament about three quarters of your way through your Bible and then go to the book of Luke, we'll be in chapter 12. And right off the bat, let me just acknowledge that I, I, know, I think I know, I can't read minds, but I think I know what some of you are probably thinking. When you hear we're talking about money, you're probably on the inside, you're like, I, I invited my friend this week, and Jeremy, who never talks about money almost, is, is going to talk about money. Are you kidding me? Right? Or maybe if you're newer to Valley, uh, you, you've had a bad taste in your mouth about this subject of money from prior religious experience or whatever, or for some, some of those televangelists you see on TV always begging for money, and you think, to, you know, you think that that's all church is about. They're just always wanting your money. Well, if you've been a part of Valley for a while, you know that's not the case with us. In fact, uh, this topic may actually be an area where I've failed you some as, as your pastor, because talking about money, if I could just say it this way, it's a little bit like talking about sex. It's very personal, and it can feel awkward, and yet uh, to not talk about money would, would, would be to really ignore an awful lot of the Bible. Let me just give you some facts and figures. Did you realize that more is said in the New Testament about money than about heaven and hell combined? Isn't that crazy to think about? The Bible says five times more about money and possessions than it actually does about prayer. 16 of the 38 parables of Jesus, 16 out of 38 of his parables all deal with money. Of the 31,000 verses in the Bible, about 2,000 of them deal with the handling of money and material possessions. So that's one in every 15 to 16 verses on average talking about this issue. So it's something we've got to talk about from time to time. And I'm almost embarrassed to say that in my 10 years of serving as your lead pastor, I've never devoted uh, a series to this topic. So for the month of January, we're going to talk about money. But I want to assure you and set you at ease, this isn't going to be some guilt-ridden, uh, manipulative, heavy-handed experience because ultimately, I know I just said this is about money, but ultimately it's not about money. It's actually about something greater than that, and it's about our entire world view. Money is just an issue. Money is just a topic that we're going to use to talk about our worldview, ultimately. Did you realize that you and I don't really have any money or possessions to call our own in the first place? I mean, when you really think about it through a biblical worldview, everything we have in our possession is actually on loan from our Creator as something that He's giving us the responsibility and opportunity to steward or manage, right? So out of habit throughout this series, you might hear me use 
use phrases like your money or my money or our money, but in reality, it's all God's. It's not any of those other people's money. It's God's money. It all comes from him and by him, and he has chosen to bless us with the management of some of his stuff. In fact, 1 Chronicles 29, King David says this. He says, yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. So God owns it all. To use the famous biblical expression from Psalm 50, he owns the cattle on what? On a thousand hills, right? The James chapter 1 says, Every good and perfect gift comes flowing down from the Father of heavenly lights. That's why we titled this message, He Owns It, We Use It, because we're simply stewards. We're managers of God's stuff. Even our ability to earn a living, if you think about it, is a precious gift from Him. And if this is true, and it is biblically, then it begs the question, or a series of questions, how are we investing God's money? What are we doing with it? Not just like the... the 10% of it or whatever we've decided is his. I'm talking about all of it, 100% of it. Where is it going? How much are we keeping and how much are we giving away to bless others with and invest into God's kingdom? And listen, I realize, let me just say right off the bat, I realize that there are some of you who are probably in a season right now where you're struggling really hard financially to make ends meet. Maybe you've recently lost a job or you've taken a severe pay cut or uh, you're just in a hard season. You've been forced to scale back. And, and, and then there are others maybe who are on the opposite end. You have a gift for making money. God has blessed you with that ability for whatever reason, and money has never been in short supply for you. And if that's you, then what a blessing to be in that place. And then for most of us, I think we're probably somewhere in the middle, right? We may wish we were more savvy at uh, making money, but at the same time, at least we've got a decent job. We're paying the bills. We're not tossing and turning, you know, at, at, at night and that kind of thing. But no matter where we find ourselves on that spectrum, God has some important things to say to us about the place of money in our lives. And so I want to open our Bibles to this amazing story in the Gospel of Luke, the third book in the New Testament. And let's turn to chapter 12, as I asked you earlier. And, and I invite you to follow along as I read a few verses, beginning in verse 13. So here's the scene. This is Jesus' famous parable of the rich fool. It says in verse 13, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, man, who, I like to read this in modern English, man, who appointed, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter uh, between you, right? Then he said to them, watch out. So he turns to the crowd, okay? And he says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what should I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus of grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. Now, I love this parable because it reveals a few practical ways in which we can learn to steward God's stuff in such a way that money doesn't take the wrong place in our lives. Now, we have to remember money's a great blessing, okay? Nobody's speaking out against having money. Uh, the Bible's not. I'm certainly not. The Bible talks about money as a great blessing and resources as a great blessing from God, okay? It, but it's just like any other blessing. It could be food. It could be sex. It could be authority. It could be influence it could be relationships, you name it. There are many things that are great blessings from God, but if they're used incorrectly or handled foolishly, they can bring great damage to people's lives. And so we will, let's see what we learn from this parable, where it says in your notes, if you're following along, five ways to keep money in its proper place. This is the first one. Don't let your world shrink to the size of your latest money problem. Jot that down. Don't let the world sink to the, shrink to the size of your latest money problem. Let's look at verse 13 again. Again, someone in the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. 
Okay, so here's a guy in this large, large crowd of people who wants Jesus to stop and take care of a money dispute, apparently, between his brother and himself. And it seems a little random that he'd be asking Jesus to kind of insert himself into this personal family matter, but it was actually quite common for people in the first century, Jews, to ask a rabbi to help with financial disputes and difficulties. So the problem is not that he wants to settle a dispute. Everything's fine with that. The problem is with his time and his priorities that we see emerging in this passage. See, Jesus is actually right in the middle of preaching a very significant sermon to this crowd, and it's almost as if this man is hearing Jesus' words in the tone of the old Charlie Brown cartoons, right? The wah, 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 wah. That's, it's like the guy's holding his breath, waiting for just the right moment to take the conversation in a totally different direction. So all the man's hearing is blah, 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 heaven and hell, life and death, future your judgment, whatever, Jesus, right? And, and, and he's basically saying, I'm not really interested in what you have to say. I just need your help with my money problem because when I have a money problem, that's practically all I can think about. And it makes me ask the question on a more personal level. I don't want to get too judgy with this guy because I have to ask, do I ever act like that? When I've got a money problem, does it consume my thinking? And I have to say that there have been times in my life that it has. You know, in the, uh, it's, it's entirely possible that this, that this man's brother was, was treating him unjustly. I'm not suggesting that, that he wasn't. I'm not suggesting that his money problem wasn't important, but I'm simply pointing out that it's not the guy's biggest problem. Okay, in the previous verses, Jesus is talking about these grand matters of eternal perspective, and all this guy can focus on is the money problem at hand. And so this is what I mean by don't shrink your world down to the size of your latest money problem. Okay, if you're in a situation where you're having a problem with money, it's not your first, it's not your last. Keep it in perspective. It's, it's not that God doesn't care about your money problem. He certainly does. But it's simply that money problems can often distract us from keeping our eyes on a greater eternal perspective. Then secondly, you can jot this down. We need, I think, to have a wartime mentality about greed and envy in our culture. I mean, if you look around at greed and envy and the, 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 its teeth, I would say, that have sunk into the fabric of our culture, I mean, you would have to be foolish to look at Western civilization and say, we don't have a greed and envy problem, right? Um, and, and, you know, in verse 15, Jesus says this to the crowd, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. See how there's this vigilant, almost militant tone to, to Jesus' words. And the reason Jesus uses this tone is because he understands that you and I, and, and his original audience as well, we are in a, in a very significant war every day of our lives. It's a, it's a war that goes all the way back to Cain and Abel in Genesis 4. It's not a military war or a physical war but, or a political war, but it's, it's a war inside the soul that can actually be uglier and more costly and consequential than a political or military war. You see, as, as much of a blessing as money is, it's one of Satan's most strategic devices for distracting us from the main thing. Satan, who is the enemy of God and the enemy of our souls, has been defeated. Thankfully, we celebrated that through communion. He's been completely defeated, defanged and declawed as the lion that he is. But he's still got a loud roar, and Jesus says that he still is a master manipulator and deceiver. And he knows that he can never have the spirits of those who belong to God, but he's nevertheless working to distract us as much as possible. So money and possessions are a great blessing. And they can be a great tool for great good, but they can also put us at great risk because every possession has the potential to possess us, to metaphorically speaking, own us, to take whatever authority we allow it to have in our lives. And this is so sad when Christians live this way because Jesus has set us free from living our lives under the bondage to, of any false gods, whether we're talking about money or possessions or power or influence or even bondage to man-made religion or whatever it is. So we would be very wise to walk with a wartime mentality concerning greed and envy. 
This doesn't mean that we have to be restless or nervous or worried or scared about anything, but it simply means we live with the constant awareness that Satan is always trying to take good things, good blessings like money, and twist them into false gods that are going to distract us from keeping our eyes fixed upon Jesus. So that's the second thing. Then a third thing we can take from Jesus' words are this, to allow wiser people to mentor us concerning money. To allow wiser people to mentor us concerning money. Look at verse 17. He thought to himself, what shall I do? Seems like an innocent enough question, but this is one of the most common ways we get in trouble with our money. Rather than seeking the counsel of wiser people than us, we just try to work everything out for ourselves. We don't dare ask anyone more experienced for their input. See, the rich man in this story is busy having a conversation with himself. He's not talking to God about it. He's not talking to uh, wise counsel about it from anybody else, about what he should do with his surplus. He just starts talking to himself and making his own plans. And again, isn't this how we behave so much of the time. All this man's plans revolve around him. He's not thinking about investing. He's not thinking about giving anything away to be a blessing to others. He's only thinking about how he'll build bigger barns to stockpile what he has accumulated. See, I believe it's wise to seek counsel about the best ways to handle money. In fact, you heard Pastor Isaac earlier in the announcement portion of our service. Just, uh, I'll just take this opportunity to kind of do a little commercial to follow up on what he said regarding Financial Peace University. We're launching it again. We do this several times, a couple times a year here at Valley. We offer it every year because we believe with everything that we are, we believe that the way that we handle God's money is either going to bring peace and blessing into our lives or it's going to bring chaos and confusion. And there's usually no middle ground. It's either peace and blessing or chaos and confusion. So if you never signed up for the Financial Peace University course, maybe you're at a place where you're just humble enough to say, yeah, I could use some expert direction on how to get out of debt and, and to live with a greater sense of financial peace and stability and sound management. I encourage you to come at least check out one of the two preview classes, February 2nd and February 5th. Uh, one will be here and one will be at Journey Coffee. And those will be the locations of the classes as well. So there'll be a weekend class offered for nine weeks as well as one at Journey Midweek so that you can have some options in terms of your schedule and how it might fit in. And so all that info is available at valleychurch.com or in your worship guide. There's no obligation to sign up for the course if you come uh, for the preview class, but that's just an invitation to come and say, is this for me? Could this benefit and transform my family the way it has for so many other people here at Valley and really around the nation? So my commercial's over, but in relation to point number three, the issue is simply we need to be talking with trustworthy people about money, just the same as we would in any other area of life. And again, FPU is a huge way that we make that opportunity available to you at Valley. Then a fourth thing we glean from Jesus' words is to remember the most important money principle of all. To remember the most important money principle of all. And that most important principle, that most critical reality is this. Death separates you from money forever right? Death separates us from money forever. And it's been doing that for as long as money and people have coexisted on planet Earth. Death caters to no one. It shows no preference or prejudice. It has no favoritism. In fact, the last time I checked, the death rate among human beings was still hovering right around 100%. <laughs> you see, we cannot lose sight of the fact that we're going to leave every single any and earthly possession behind us someday, except, except what? Except whatever we've invested in the eternal things of the kingdom of God. Look at verse 20. But God said to him, you fool, this very night you will be, your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you've prepared for yourself? See, the rich man is living as though this life is all there is right here, right now. And that's the greatest miscalculation you and I can possibly make. We can recover from a lot of mistakes. I mean, God is a God of who writes redemptive, re redemption stories day in and day out for billions of people all over planet Earth. We can learn to thrive and survive again when we've made a mistake. But it's a fatal miscalculation to live as though this life is all there is. And again, focus with me on the question God asks of the rich man in the story. 
then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? In other words, who's going to get all this? Because you ain't taking it with you. I've joked in the past about the fact that of the hundreds and hundreds of funerals that I've been so privileged to be a part of as a pastor over the last almost quarter century now, I, I've joked with you that uh, never once have I ever, ever, ever been at the graveside and seen the hearse pull up to a U-Haul. That just doesn't happen. You don't get to take this stuff with you. So that's the reality. It's, it's the most critical approach that we can take regarding money and possessions is this. We are blessed in order to be a blessing to somebody else. And yes, we should be a blessing to our close friends and family. There's everything right about investing in, in, in your family and your kids and your spouse and building memories and taking vacations and investing in relationships and using your money or God's money in that way. But we are also here to give selflessly in ways that may never personally benefit us on this temporary earth until we get to see the fruit of those investments in the eternal kingdom one day. And then we'll be able to celebrate those things with one another forever. This is what Jesus meant when he says further down in the passage, we won't get to it this week, but he says, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy. And then finally, let me give you one more thing we get from Jesus found in verse 21. Look at it with me. Jesus says, this is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. In other words, you can jot this down. The fifth and final thing is to make richness toward God your life's priority. Richness toward God. What does that mean to be rich toward a God who already owns it all, right? I mean, if God owns everything, he certainly doesn't need our money. Well, let me shatter your theology a little bit for a second. There is actually one thing, and I know those of you who are like me, who make much of God's sovereignty and his power, you're going to call me a heretic when this rolls off my tongue, but follow me here. There's one thing that God doesn't already have in his possession. He could, but he's designed it in such a way that he doesn't. And that one thing that God doesn't already have is your worship, my worship, our worship. Think about it. God certainly could have created us like robots, couldn't he? I mean, can you imagine? To, uh, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. I mean, boring, right? I mean, how, how God could have created a humanity that, 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 that related to him like a robot, okay? But real worship is, is a response to the power and the goodness and the character of God. It's not something that can be forced or manipulated. It's a love relationship that God has called you and I into. And as I mentioned during the Q&A session last week, love by definition requires mutuality. It requires freedom of choice. It's, it's, it's not something that can be forced. And when we prioritize our time and we prioritize our talent and we prioritize even our our earthly material treasures around God and his glory. This is how we begin to live a life that is rich toward him. The only thing that God doesn't automatically already own is our worship because he's left that opportunity to us. In fact, he created every single one of us as expert worshipers. Did you realize that? I said this before, but you know, you're an expert worshiper from the moment you arrive on planet Earth, even the most ardent atheist friends that I have are expert worshipers. They're just worshiping the wrong God. Whether, you know, when we're babies and toddlers, you think about this, we pretty much worship ourselves, right? We're good at it. We're worshiping the wrong God, but we're good at it. I mean, we want someone to change our diapers on command. We want to be fed on demand. We want every need of ours to be taken care of at our cry or our holler or whatever. And, you know, that's normal for a two-year-old. It's actually kind of cute, but it's not so cute when full-grown adults are living this way, right? All you have to do to prove that you're born an expert worshiper or that we're born expert worshipers, just put two toddlers in a room with one toy. See how that works out. Very soon, you see that each of these kids is a professional worshiper. It's in their DNA. The only problem, the only question, the only problem is they're worshiping themselves, right? The question is not, am I a worshiper? The answer to that is yes, I'm a very good worshiper. I don't even need practice. I came this way. I was designed this way. The real question is, what God am I worshiping at any given time? See, we need to be taught 
to share. And more than that, we need to receive the divine power within ourselves from a source that we weren't born with in order to live according to this new supernatural way of life, this, generous, uh, this generosity from the heart, this obedience from the heart, as Paul the Apostle would put it. So we can use the treasures that God has loaned to us as instruments of worship to Him in the ways that we bless others. And that's exactly what Jesus has done for us through the gospel. The moment we trust in Christ, we become what Jesus referred to as spiritually reborn. In John 3, Nicodemus says, how can I be born again or reborn? How can I possibly enter back into my mother's womb as a full-grown adult? And Jesus says, I'm not talking about a physical rebirth. I'm talking about a spiritual rebirth, Nicodemus. And this means that when we experience this physical rebirth, that old sinful spirit, that selfish nature that we inherited from our earliest ancestor, Adam, and has been passed on down through the centuries, that old man or woman has been crucified and replaced by a new generous, righteous spirit that is at the core of who we truly are now. See, the very reason so many of us fail to live lives of sacrifice, live lives of generosity, is not because we lack the inner character to live that way. We have everything we need for life and godliness in Christ already. Okay, we've already got the character of Jesus himself in us. The problem is not with our character, the problem is with our faith. We don't actually live believing that we are indeed the new creations God says we are. Why? Because we follow our feelings more than we follow the facts as God has declared them to us. We don't always feel new, do we? I don't always feel generous, do I? I have old habits and hurts and hang-ups that, that follow me into this life, and it's part of the flesh. It's not me anymore, but it's just part of that old way of life that as a disciple of Jesus, I'm learning those grave clothes are continually coming off. I'm a resurrected human being, right, on the inside. But Jesus is constantly stripping those grave clothes away from me as I grow in him. And I don't want to be carrying those grave clothes around. I'm I'm a new creation and I will only feel fulfilled to the degree that I'm walking in obedience to the Lord, whether it's in the area of money or any other area of life. And so this circles right, uh, right on around back to, to point number two is that we are so distracted by the materialism sometimes in this world that we don't want to admit how easy it is to fall into patterns of greed and envy. And I'm not pointing any fingers here, by the way, because, you know, I, I'm talking from personal experience. Anything I preach from the Bible as an exhortation or an encouragement to you, you better believe I take it seriously for myself first. And everywhere I look in this world, I'm being told, you're being told, I'm being told that I need a better car. I'm being told that my 12-year-old pickup, it's perfectly fine is not good enough and I need the shinier one, right? I'm not against getting a new pickup. I'm not putting a guilt trip on anybody, okay? Uh, but I'm always being told I need a better car. I need a better wardrobe. I need a better house. I need a better spouse. I need a better body. I need a better whatever it is. And this in spite of the fact that 1 Timothy 6 says this, godliness with contentment is the greatest possible thing we will ever gain in this life. Think about that. The blessing of living a content life. Because living a content life sets us free from always feeling like we're lacking something. And guess what? When I'm walking in faith that what God says about me is actually true, and when I'm trusting that everything I truly need I already have in Christ, then and only then can I begin to love you in such an unconditional way that I can love you without expecting or demanding anything from you in return, and vice versa. It's such a blessing, you know, to walk outside in the morning. And, and I, I did it today in, in the 40 degree weather. Take a deep breath of fresh air. See the sun starting to come up over the horizon. And just to actually walk out every morning and feel like I'm the richest man in my neighborhood. Do I earn the biggest paycheck in my neighborhood? No. Am I the richest man in my neighborhood? I think so because I'm walking in an attitude of gratitude and contentment. And the moment, I wish I could say I was 100% at this, but at the moment my soul takes a turn away from that mentality, the moment I begin to entertain those lies that I'm bombarded with every day is the moment I lose that sense of richness toward life and toward God. 
So I hope you're feeling super encouraged by this today. This is, you know, there's a way to talk about money in church that is very practical and freeing, and that's what I want to focus on in this series. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. So basically, he just says that, that your bank statement says an awful lot about where your passions are. That's all that means. And I'm certainly still a work in progress like the rest of us, but I'm so thankful. I'm just going to share with you as we close. I'm so thankful that April and I have made this not just a priority, but an honor in our lives to be rich toward God with our monthly budget uh, uh, above everything else. The first item in our budget every month is what we've decided to commit to God. And we've lived this way for nearly 24 years of our marriage. And again, I'm not against, nor is God against having nice things. God loves it when you take a vacation with your family. I think he loves it when you smell that new car smell, if he's allowed you to to do that or whatever. He loves that you can provide things for your kids, uh, you know, with what he's given you. But we've seen God be so faithful to to us over the years as we've chosen to give a large large percentage of our income, of his income, his money, back to him. And he's taught us that we don't give in order to get more from God. You realize that this is a popular religious thing out there, right? You see it from TV preachers and and some pulpits of churches, uh, you know, all over the place. This idea that, hey, you put in your 10 10 and God will give you a hundredfold back or whatever. And it's just these treating God like a slot machine. Like the more you put in, the more you get out. That's not biblical. We don't give to get. We get to give. That's how we look at it. I think that's how Jesus wants us to look at it. And I want every single one of us to walk into the reality of greater gratitude and contentment and generosity because if you don't walk in that mindset, it doesn't matter how much money you have, it'll never satisfy. It'll never be enough. There are multi-million dollar making CEOs who are jumping off bridges in places every year because money is not the answer to their problems. So thanks for taking this to heart today. I hope you're feeling built up and not beaten up. I have to say, I, I accidentally said beat up at the earlier service and everybody cracked up. I said, I hope you're feeling beat up today, b- b- uh, built up today. Um, stupid, you know, faux pas, uh, Freudian slip. Because um, I know somebody can take what I say online and, and edit it together and make it say something that I didn't mean. But um, that's the world we live in, right? But Jesus wants you to be walking in greater alignment with the new person that he's recreated you to be on the inside. And when you're walking in stride with the real you, that's where real freedom is experienced. Not just in the area of your finances, but in every area of life. We need to come to the conclusion and settle the issue in our hearts once and for all. Whose universe is this? Mine? or his. Let me pray for you. Generous God, we thank you that we could never outgive you. But we also thank you for the opportunities we have even daily to reflect your character and your glory as we walk by an increasing measure of generosity. I thank you for Valley, a church that's been so generous for so many years in this community and around the world. I I thank you that the deposits that have been and are being made in places like Papua New Guinea and Colombia and Rwanda and Kenya and Mexico and in the Middle East and in, in South Asia and so many other places around the world. I, I thank you that, that we've been able to expand so far beyond just even what you're doing in us and through us here in Vacaville. And I pray that as a new generation of disciples is raised up here, that we would carry on this legacy in even greater ways and that you would get all glory every step of the way. Thank you for the reminder that we don't give to get. We get to give. And even now as as we have this opportunity, I pray that you would be glorified. The little children and teenagers, and young adults, and marriages, and singles, and men, and women, and seniors, and at-risk kids, and homeless neighbors, and people in crisis, 
would continue to be built up through the ministries of Valley Church. We live in a world that's constantly tearing at us, tearing us down. We thank you that you're a God who builds us up. And so we give toward that end because we're blessed in order to be a blessing. It's in Jesus' name we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. Love you, Valley. Well, you know, as I send you out, you, you know that there's one thing I definitely do not want you to feel, and that's beaten up, right? I want you to feel built up. I want you to hold your heads high as a blood-bought son or daughter of the living God who loved you so much that he would send heaven's best to redeem you. You think about this world that we're in and how often even our youth are struggling. And many of us as adults, we struggle with self-worth. We struggle with the meaning of life and, and the value of, of who we are. And Jesus puts an end to all those questions, right? When he comes and gives his life for us. Because we know at the end of the day, the only true way that we can determine the value of someone or something is based upon whatever the highest bidder is willing to pay for that someone or something. You take that perspective out with you this week and you think to yourself, man, Jesus paid the highest price to redeem me. And that speaks into not only my value, but everyone else he died for. So let's not only treat ourselves with that value, let's go out and love our neighbors with that kind of value as well. How about that? Love you, Valley. God bless you. Have a great weekend.